Hi, this is Ned Siegfried from Siegfried & Jensen. As proud sponsors of BeliefCast, we hope you are inspired by Todd's weekly podcasts, which contain so many courageous stories of recovery and personal growth. Remember, it's not what happened in the past that matters, it's what happens in the future. We invite you all to work hard and be optimistic about your future. Enjoy today's podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you once again for tuning in week after week. We're trending. Uh, we're ranked uh, in the top 150 in mental health in the world. So thankful for all of you because it's because of you guys. Um, you're not only <clears throat> listening in, but you're sharing these uh, amazing guests that I have on who are sh- being vulnerable and they're, they're talking about some things that they've been through. And I'm just so grateful for you. And I want you to know how much I love you guys. I would like to take the time to thank our sponsors, Siegfried and Jensen and Ned Siegfried. Thank you so much. Wasatch Recovery and Mark Richards, who runs an amazing program. I Hill Institute with Rebecca D. Azevedo. She's an amazing woman. Drew Peterson, the former owner of Veracity Networks. Thank you for your support. And then Living Recoveries Interventions with Travis Whitaker. Travis, you're an amazing man. I love all you guys. Thank you for your support. And I um, also like to thank my previous guests. They've been amazing. And today's going to be no different. Today, we're joined by Ann Moss Rogers. Ann Moss, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And Todd, I'm so excited that you are trending and that, the, that mental health is now in the forefront of what we're discussing. So yes, thank you. You betcha. Well, you guys are going to be blown away by Ann Moss and her story and what she's been through and what she's doing now to make a difference in this world. Um, we do need to give a, a little uh, warning here. We're going to talk about a very uh, sensitive and serious subject. We're going to talk about suicide um, and we're going to talk about uh, suicide prevention. Um, there is a crisis hot, uh, hotline, which is 800-273-8255. Um, it'll be changing in July, but uh, we're going to, I'm going to say that again. It's 800-273-8255. And then there's also a crisis text that uh, 741-741. If any of you are struggling at that time, at this time, hearing this even, please call those numbers or text. Uh, anyway, love you guys. And thanks for tuning in. Boy, you guys are going to love uh, Ann Moss. A um, little background. Um, she is emotionally naked public speaker, which we're going to talk about what that means. TEDx storyteller, certified suicide prevention trainer. Um, she's an NAMI, excuse me, NAMI, yeah, Virginia board member and the award-winning author of Diary of a Broken Mind, She's also wrote, written another book called Emotionally Naked. Um, after her 20-year-old son, Charles, died by suicide on June 5th, 2015, Ann Moss chronicled her family's tragedy in a newspaper article that went viral, and her blog, Emotionally Naked, had, has reached millions. And I'm so excited to talk about that, Ann Moss. Um, and then, like we talked about, she's written that second book. She's been featured in New York Times. Uh, she was the first non-clinician ever invited to speak at the National Institute of Mental Health on suicide. Congratulations to that. That's beautiful. Um, you currently live in Richmond, Virginia with her husband, her surviving son, Richard. And uh, we're going to actually, you know, dedicate this to all those who are struggling, but especially to her, her son who passed away, Charles. So Ann Moss. Thank you. Yes, yeah, you're so welcome. And I could, I, you're, I could keep going with your bio here, but uh, um, I, I just want to maybe start off by asking you, talking about this and sharing this, you say in a talk of yours that talking about suicide actually saves lives. So maybe I can ask you, why, why is that the case? Um, well, a lot of people think it inserts the idea into someone's head and I can understand that because I think at one point I wondered if that was the case too. Yeah. So what we have found and many multiple studies have been done done on this and we always come up with the same answer that it actually encourages those who are struggling to reach out because Mm. it is so stigmatized. Yeah. And However, I want to make the distinction that being exposed to a suicide, a suicide in your family, a suicide in your community or a school or among your friend group 
can increase someone's risk for suicide. So that's why it's important for us to start talking about it so that we have several people in the same community who are kind of looking out for each other and mm. recognizing those signs and having those conversations with their loved ones. Yeah. Wow. Well, and that's, that's very well said. You know, I wanted to start off, we, I want to talk about what happened with your son. I know you wrote a blog post, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was titled the final 48 hours. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. And that went viral. And I remember you received a letter from someone after that, that said they were thinking about taking their life and they decided not to seek help because of what you had written. And um, so I want to talk about that. So talk about what happened up to that point and whatever you're comfortable with sharing about your son, Charles. Sure. So Charles is the funniest, most popular kid in school. And he was the last person you would have expected would have taken his life. And he was around 2010. He started his drug use started to escalate. And I, I was like, we talked about this. And he had said the year before, I'm, I'm never doing this. And all of a sudden, he, he was doing all this crazy stuff. And you know, robo tripping, you name it. I mean, I was finding yeah. empty Cool Whip, uh, not uh, Ready Whip containers right. everywhere yeah. and beer bottles in the eaves of, of the um, attic. And I was like, wow, what is up? Yeah. What was happening is that my son was struggling with depression and thoughts of suicide and decided to use substances so that he wouldn't kill himself mm. and to a teenager you know it's like that here and now i want to use something to numb it now and of course that is what actually drove him to suicide in the end to actually die that way but you know kind of looking back i can understand his thinking but at the time i did not I mean, yeah. I didn't know about his thoughts of suicide. I didn't know he struggled with depression. He ends up becoming um, addicted to heroin. I, and that is after we went through, you know, sending him to a therapeutic boarding school and a wilderness program. I mean, we spent a lot of money. And then we had to travel up there to do family work and, you know, that therapy experience. Yeah. So it wasn't like we sent him away to be fixed and thought, oh, he's going to come back a pretty package all done. And I knew it didn't work that way, but I had hoped he would develop the coping strategies that would replace the drugs and alcohol. Right. That didn't, that didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it sometimes. It just, you know, it just yeah. doesn't always work out. He came home and almost immediately became addicted to heroin. And meanwhile, I think I am blocking it. I am doing everything to, to make sure he doesn't need heroin. And he was already deep into it. And I didn't know it because he was doing those drugs at night. Mm. He was snorting it, which I didn't even know was possible. I thought it had to be done with a needle or a prescription. Mm. And I, I was wrong. And, yeah. uh, you know, I was naive and I was trying. It was really hard to keep up with the mental illness, the groups I was with. And then all of a sudden, this addiction, which I didn't know about until 30 days before his death. Okay. So then I kind of had to cram, you yeah, know, because right. before yeah. then, it had been marijuana and, you know, alcohol and, so now it was this new thing and, you know, which one is the right information. And then some of it was so depressing that I was having trouble. Yeah. I had to cut it off. You know, it, yeah. it was just taking me to a, a really bad place. And I just, I just had to pull out. So he finally confesses, he goes to uh, detox and rehab. And then he relapses right when he gets to a recovery house. And so he sees a friend at the uh, 
when they take him back to detox, that was their protocol, is when somebody relapsed at a recovery house, you can't be using in a recovery house, right? right? Yeah, right. So they took him uh, back to detox, they got him checked in, and the house manager left and sent us a text. And then the next text was that he had seen a friend and they had walked out together because Todd, they just wanted one more party, one yeah. more hit, yeah. and then they'd go back, you know? Right. And, and that didn't happen. And then for two weeks, we didn't know where he was. And we're sitting in the back of a police car in a parking lot when the policeman gave us the news that they had found our son dead, I was sure it was overdose because by now we know about heroin right. and we've heard about all these overdoses. For sure, yeah. You know, we're screaming and wailing and, you know, we're out of our minds, we're in shock. And my husband says, how did he die? And the policeman actually told us the method of his suicide. And that method left no question. It was not an overdose. And mm. I was just shocked. I couldn't even breathe. My husband is oh, man. beating on the glove box, having an emotional breakdown. I can't even let the words. I, it, it was so shocking to me. And then yeah. my first thought is, how could I be such a crummy mother that my child would check out on me. Didn't he know we loved them? But it wasn't about me. Yeah. And my son suffered unimaginable emotional pain and the physical pain of withdrawal when he took his own life. Yeah. And that's often what we don't talk a lot about. I know that people in the recovery community talk about the risk of suicide all the time to each other, but the rest of the world doesn't really know the risk of suicide, particularly right when they first go into recovery, yeah. um, <clears throat> right when they're going through withdrawal, when they're transitioning back to the community and you know how hard that is, you gotta oh, make yeah. new friends, yeah. find new job, housing. It's heavy, yep. It is, it takes everything you have and it is a very challenging time and a lot of people say oh my child relapsed and sometimes they do but how many of those are intentional yeah yeah in my line of work uh i hear this all the time and you 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 said it perfectly Ann moss that that uh that transition for for clients when they leave treatment it's like now they're that again they they feel exposed too, you know, that, that emotionally naked that, that you're going to be talking about here in a minute, but it's like, what do I do? How do I find a job? I have no money. I need to, you know, I need to get a car. I need to get my license back. I need to all these things, you know, and just the, 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 the emotional and mental stress that puts on someone is, is very, very di uh, difficult for them to deal with. So thanks for bringing that up. Cause that's a good point for sure. And then the court cases. And, right. you know, the, I yeah. can't get my license back because I have $20,000 worth of fines before I can get a car back. Right. Yeah. And I mean, how yeah. overwhelming that sure. that is. Yeah. It's just, just, it's just awful. Well, I'm so sorry to hear this about Charles. And, uh, but I know that afterwards you ended up eventually writing a blog post, like we mentioned called the final 48 hours and tell us why you wrote that and why you decided to do that. So um, it was, I had written an article that went viral. And right before that article came out, I started the blog called Emotionally Naked to find healing through writing and shine a spotlight on all the topics of mental illness, suicide and coping strategies and highlighting other people's story of coming out of the darkness. So how, right. how did you do it? Right. Because I wanted hope and healing to be part of that message as well. I am facing my son's first death anniversary 
and I am falling apart. Super epic grief relapse because yeah. grief isn't this linear thing. It's right. kind of this tangled mess of emotions that you somehow get the rhythm of over time. I'm facing that. It's midnight. I can't sleep. I get up. I start writing this blog post about how we got the news. Step by step, what they said, what we said, how we reacted, made basically bringing people into the scenario where I got the news. Yeah. My hand hovers over, you know, I shouldn't publish this. I shouldn't expose everyone to my ugly, naked mama grief. You know, I'm just asking for pity. And then finally, I'm like, I just got to publish it. Yeah. But I don't have to share it on social media and it was the first post that i never shared on social media really wow my subscribers they connected with it and they shared it and all of a sudden i, I get all these messages from my hosting company i've got to you know <laughs> increase my you know bandwidth yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about i just started this a month ago <laughs> And I'm just like, what is going on? And I looked at my stats and I'm like, holy cow. I was just <laughs> blown away by yeah. the number of people that come to my itty bitty little yeah. blog. And then I get two days later, I, I, I get a message from this girl named Lauren that says two days ago, I thought about taking my life. But reading a post from a mother who's felt such devastating pain has changed my perspective on life. Wow. And Todd, that was the first time I recognized that that some that people wanted to tell. I, I thought it was this big secret that, yeah. that people kept themselves and that they didn't want to tell. I didn't understand how desperately people want to tell. And that it was the stigma and the shame that kept people from telling yeah and this blog post nearly validated what she already wanted to do and and i will be very clear that had i been sitting across from lauren and talking to her if i had said well what about your parents she would have felt ashamed and yeah. she would have withdrawn yeah so it was kind of like this was her own discovery I'm going to click through and see what this mother feels. So it was a choice. Yeah. And she had never thought about it from her parents' point of view. Yeah. But I didn't like start telling her, you know, it's, so it's right. different, yeah. you know, it was that self-discovery. And that was when I finally figured out, huh, you know, I'm, I'm a digital marketing expert. I've, I've gotten plumbers leads online by using their frequently asked questions and doing a really good job of answering those questions and yeah. getting top spots on Google. Yeah. Why can't I do that for people who are searching for a way to die? Wow. And, and perhaps there are a few of them that, that we can kind of pull out of that trance because they may not even understand what they're searching because they're sort of in that mode or that episode where their brain yeah. is being held hostage by thoughts of suicide. Yeah. Wow. Very well said. Thank you for sharing that. I'm very touching um, that that girl reached out to you. Is that when you kind of decided you know what, I need to share and continue to share because you, you talk about this all the time, how sharing saves lives. And obviously, you know, to take that one girl, you just mentioned Lauren, who it saved her life by listening to a mom who's gone through and the, the pain that she, you, you were going through that she could relate with on some level. I mean, I, that just is so fascinating. Is that when you decided you wanted to kind of just broaden your scope and start sharing with as many people as you could? I did. It, it completely changed my life. I sold my digital marketing business and decided mm -hmm. to pursue suicide prevention full time. 
Wow. And, you know, I've got a foot in the addiction world yeah. and prevention there, and then a foot in the suicide prevention. And you'd be surprised at how many similarities there are along the way. But our society still wants to put them in two separate little silos. Yeah. But to our brain, they're, they're cake batter, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. There, there is no, there is no different. So, um, but yeah, that was when I decided and then trying to figure out what that contribution would be. So I've, I've written, I have at least 50 ranked blog, blog posts that people only find through search. So I have 3000 blog posts. Wow. And yeah. And a <laughs> lot of them are words that people use. So I know how to do that. Right. So that has really helped, you know, it's helped people find healing. It's helped yeah. people, you know, should I kick my loved one out of the house, you know, for their addiction? I can't live with them anymore. And I have a blog post on that because it's not a simple question. Right. And I also don't want people to ever think it's kicked out, you know, and yeah i don't and friends will say you need to kick him out it's like you're not living this you have no idea yeah. what what should be done right now that is so true you know such a complicated question and it's the number one question i get you know i can't live again what do i do you know how am i gonna i can't live every day like this because i'm in my loved one's firestorm yeah and you know it's turning my life upside down yeah no and i you know can we touch on that for a minute ann moss because sure. i get that question all the time all should the i time. kick my son out he's using in the basement should i kick my daughter out she's drinking on the weekends or whatever what let, what are your thoughts on that and what could you a parent listening to you right now what would you tell them and, and I, again you obviously got some experience in this so i'd love to hear what you have to say on that first we should never withdraw love okay. and we should never think of it as leverage for them finding rock bottom or recovery because as you know some people have some firestorm thing happen but some people are sitting in a coffee shop and they're like i don't want to do this anymore mm -hmm. i have a loved one that just came home for a holiday and woke up one morning after a huge binge and said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going into recovery. You know, just like that. There wasn't any big, yeah. you know, catastrophic yeah. event. Yeah. So sometimes we think that kicking them out and let's just say them moving out is going to spur them into um, recovery. And we just don't know that that's the case. I mean, yeah. in my point of, from my point of view, my son's rock bottom was suicide. It was killing himself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he thought it was a withdrawal of love. So I love Ryan Hampton's example of, he was couch surfing while he was using and he wasn't living with his mother. He was in his thirties and she would come and meet him for lunch or bring him dinner wherever he was because she always wanted to make sure that he knew he was loved no matter what. And I wish I had said to my own son, as much as I want you to get well, I love you. Even if you don't. So yeah. I needed to preface it with that. Okay. You need to think about, can I live this with this anymore? We had decided we could not. We didn't end up asking our son to leave because he went to detox and rehab. Yeah. And then we made the decision that he would go to recovery house and we would support that. He wanted to come home and I couldn't take any more sketchy strangers in the house at right. 2 a.m. Yeah, you know, right. I was sure. afraid to leave my own bedroom. Mm. Um, 
I would hear the garage door go up, the, the dog would come in distress, there'd be vomit on the floor any given day. Um, you know, he would set off the alarm, the burners would still be on when, when I'd wake up in the morning. And there were a couple of incidences that had happened in the neighborhood where I knew he went into someone else's house. And I'm like, I can't be responsible for that behavior right so we had and we had our house on, on the market actually it already sold um so we were moving you know there wasn't really a place to leave we were packing up his room yeah right so it it was an easy decision for us to say after going to the rehab and the detox that he go to a recovery house because that was where the people could support each other. It's peer recovery and it works. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, it means the person isn't ready or their maladaptive tendencies haven't had a time, ha had the opportunity of working through all those exercises that kind of gets your brain back to thinking in a normal way. Because as you know, you that just takes time for your brain to rewire yeah absolutely so you have to judge and i also don't judge someone who decides that I, I i can live with this and if they're still using and they're not cooking at night and it's not putting other family members in at risk i mean some people have young children and they can't have somebody you know yeah. shooting up in the basement it's yeah. not safe for sure so you just have to figure out what your situation is and how you actually go about asking them to leave is really hard because a lot of people want to rent a house or an apartment and that i've never heard that turn out well because it usually right. comes place yeah. that everybody goes to use for free and it becomes a trap house exactly yeah and so yeah. you know you you have to get both parents to decide and make an ultimatum that you know we just can't live with this anymore and you know here's some places um if you want to go into recovery but you know, we love you no matter what. We just, we can't live with you anymore. Yeah. And that is so, so hard. And the That's article so on my yeah. site is, should you kick your addicted child out of the house? Great. And we'll reference that uh, in the show notes as well. So people can find that on, on your blog. And thank you for uh, that information. That's very, very well said. And we needed to hear that. So thank you so much. You're um, welcome. I'm sorry there are no definitive answers. No, no, to that I know question. that. I, yeah, I know. I, I go through it all the time with my clients, uh, parents. So I know exactly what you're saying. You know, you, you, you call yourself an emotionally naked public speaker. I know what that means, but maybe our listeners don't. Will you explain why you say emotionally naked? You know, it's vulnerability times 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I think that after I wrote that first article, I felt vulnerable, but more than that, I felt stripped naked, left on an island with TV cameras all around me. It felt, so it's kind of like that vulnerability plus the spotlight. And it is, it's intense and you feel like that's a huge risk. But it's also a beautiful place to be because there's so much freedom once yeah. you've made that decision to just yeah. let it go yeah, and not worry about your image. And after I wrote the newspaper article and they told me it was going to be in the Sunday paper, I was terrified. <laughs> I mean terrified right i had to pull over <laughs> do deep breathing exercises because todd <laughs> the first thing i thought about is oh i forgot to tell anyone <laughs> i forgot to tell my husband my mother oh no my business partner <laughs> my best friend and i was like oh 
my gosh, what have I done? Oh man, I can imagine. So I had I had to send it off to them first. My husband was so so supportive. Oh great. Um, my mother not at first, yeah. um, and she worried that you know I was putting myself in a vulnerable position and that yeah. people would judge me and that would make things worse. But I had already thought through that scenario. I had kind of made a list of all the best and worst things that could happen. Yeah. And I talked talked my way through them. And that I call it my alter ego. Okay. And we have conversations in my head. <laughs> and I'm like, what is so bad about that? You said you were going to be bold. We didn't think this would be like, you know, skipping yeah. through a meadow, you know, with a basket of daisies and muffins, you know. Right. It it is more like pushing a spike ball uphill in a snowstorm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, that's, I can only it's imagine. Pushback. Yeah. Well, I do respect that about you. Honestly, you're very real. You're authentic. Uh, again, you're, you're not afraid to talk about tough things. And I think that's why people love you so much. You know, I've watched, I've done a ton of research on you. I've watched your talks. I've watched, you know, I've read your blog. I've, I mean, I'm just so blown away at your authenticity and your, your vulnerability, you, you call it emotionally naked <laughs> times 10, <laughs> which, which I totally agree. But I think that's what people are starving for. And I think that's why people resonate with you so much is, and like, you know, going back to that girl, Lauren, I am sure that's why she's like, wow, I'm hearing this raw, raw feelings from this mom who just lost her son, Charles. And uh, man, I don't want to have to put my family through that. And I mean, that's because you're being completely, as you say, naked and weren't, weren't yeah. afraid to put it out there. So I just want you to know, I respect that so much, Ann Moss, that you do that. Well, thank you. And it, it also, I have to add that I also needed to learn how to do that responsibly. Yeah. Because this subject can trigger people. So yeah. I'm not, I don't reveal the titles of some of the blog posts that are most popular from Google for a reason. One may yeah. they, they can potentially trigger someone and that can be very dangerous. Um, you know, like we had trigger warning and we had resources that we talked about prior to this podcast so that we yeah. could have a res you yeah. know a respectful conversation on it. And I needed to understand what I needed to stay away from in order to recognize people's safety and, and respect that. And so I, I also spent a lot of time researching that and right. reading a lot of uh, like the <clears throat> reporting guidelines on suicide, um, getting real training. And, and at first I talked more about the addiction and a little less about the suicide because I wasn't, I, I wasn't real sure about the subject at first. I talked yeah. about the fact that he died by suicide, but I, I didn't make like X, I didn't come across as an expert because I wasn't one. I, I am now, but I wasn't back then. And I needed to to treat the the subject with care, yeah, but also not avoid it. And and that that took a lot of work, but it was so worth it. And I got so much out of it by becoming more educated yeah. and talking to people with lived experience, and then talking to suicidologists and other experts. Yeah, wow, I love it. Let me just quickly. Uh say the suicide prevention lifeline again is 800-273-8255. I just want to uh, put that in there right now. Uh, Ann Moss, you've written a, a couple books. Uh, you have an award-winning book called Diary of a Broken Mind. Do you mind explaining what that book is about and, and, and why you wrote that? Well, my soul is between those two book covers. Mm. And it took over a year to write. And before my son died by suicide, I was writing a book in my head because I needed to have some grandiose, positive story, you know, yeah. written in my head. Yeah. And as soon as he died, 
the the subject and how that book would be written completely changed. And it did continue to stalk me until I started to to put it on paper. Okay. And I called it Diary of a Broken Mind because that was the name of one of my son's songs. Okay. So I, every other chapter after chapter three is one of his rap music songs that explains, I mean, he was so incredible about captivating how it feel, felt to be addicted, how yeah. it felt to suffer from depression and thoughts of suicide. And then there's some funny songs and some right. hopeful songs in there. Yeah. But anyone that wants to understand our family stories deserve to hear it from his point of view as well as mine. Right. So as I write the memoir, it, okay. it's followed, each chapter is followed by a chapter that of his writing. Okay. To sort of tell this family story and the feedback. Oh my gosh, it's been incredible. I just heard from my co-writer of my second book, the one, The Teacher's Guide for Preventing Suicide. And she was like, I finished it in one sitting. It's the most powerful book I've ever read in my life. Wow. And I was really touched because Kim is, I, I, I so respect her. She's so sure. amazing. Sure. And of all the, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback. I, I swear to, you know, anybody a movie star could have said that but the fact that kim did it <laughs> right. it, it meant so much it meant the world too yeah yeah and it it allows people to understand it what their children are going through so it is for parents who have not lost a child uh to addiction or suicide and it is for ones that that have and it, it's been, that's been a remarkable journey. And now it's available worldwide as of last week. Um, oh, wow. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. So well, it's you know, taken a while. Yeah. Well, again, I love all the good you're doing. And Moss, you know, I, I, again, I get choked up when I think that you lost your son. Thank you. He was such a doll baby. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, but I'm going to cry right with you. you <laughs> know <what I> mean? <laughs> yeah. I just, it, I just love, uh, your example of taking this tragedy and, uh, doing so much good with it. And, uh, you know, I, I hate that you had to go through that, but I'm so grateful that we have you, um, spreading this message and helping parents who are, don't have the answers, you know, and they, and they need just some guidance. And you're an excellent writer, by the way. Um, oh, you're just you. really good at the way you create a, a story and a narrative is so powerful. And I really do respect that. Um, what, you know, if there's someone right now that's listening to your voice, who's struggling, who is in that dark place, what, what's something that you could tell them right now, you've already shared some great things, but that one person right now, who's just on the edge and just struggling, what would you tell them right now? Well, they think they're a burden, right? And they do, they're not telling anyone how they're struggling because they feel like they're a burden. But what you don't realize is that you're sharing yourself and your soul is a gift to another person to make yeah. them feel honored and and loved and important enough to receive that news and i think that choosing that right person to share with it's so important and i've, I've written a blog post also at, you know how do you tell someone you want to die oh and i give gosh. give them scripts you know and what to say and how to pick the right person and that gets a lot of searches from Google as well, because people want to tell us. We say, reach out, but yeah. we don't say, how do you tell someone? And if you are thinking of suicide, you have to say, this is really scaring me. I, I don't know where it comes from, but 
I am struggling with thoughts of suicide and I need some help. You must say the words, I am thinking about killing myself or I am thinking about suicide. You have to be very direct. Yeah. Yeah. No. And oftentimes it's, you know, oftentimes the person you're telling may not think you're serious so that's why picking a person that you trust and is empathetic and people who struggle with thoughts of suicide are naturally empaths anyway yeah and they're really good at picking out the right person that can be trusted with this information yeah it's so important to tell and for those of you who lived with a loved one who struggle the greatest gift you can give to another human being is to let them feel heard. So you have to do that thing called listening, which means shutting up, (laughs) (laughs) right? (laughs) listening more and lecturing less. And that is, you know, uh, questions like, why, why do you think you're a burden? Um, How long have you felt this way? Tell me more about how you feel. I'm so sorry you feel that way. You don't want to say you have so much to live for because you're not meeting people where they are. They're in despair. They're in darkness. That's where you got to go. You don't have to go and sit that way forever. Right. But that's what deepens your human relationships. Yeah. Because the path to joy is often through pain. And a lot of people don't recognize, not always, but where we find and where we grow and what you're going through now, that pain is our emotional building blocks to healing. Just like after you go have knee surgery and you come back home and it's all blown up and it's hurting like crazy. A week later, it doesn't because it's healing. And that's the same with emotional pain. That pain has purpose. Wow. And it is emotional healing. And if you keep it all bottled up in there, it's just going to take up more of your brain real estate. You got to let it go. You got to let it vent. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful advice. Thank you so much. And can you also share me that link to that pod or to that blog post um, as well? Because I want to add that to the show notes as well. It's um, the, the kick addicted out of the house. Cause that's, the I've chat. got that. I've got that one. And then the other one, um, you just mentioned, how do you tell someone you want to die? Oh yeah. I've got that one. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. You know, if, if someone wants to, I mean, you've got a website, uh, and mossrogers.com emotionally naked.com. You've written two books. Uh, you, you got an amazing blog. It's just amazing. Um, You're doing all these great things. What's the best way for someone to reach out to you if they have a question, if they want to know more, they want to learn about what you're doing or listen to your next speech? What's the best way for someone to do that, Ann Moss? Well, right, they can go to emotionallynaked.com and click the events tab. And that is all my latest events. And just go through the contact form. And uh, I'm I'm on social media a lot, LinkedIn the most, Facebook, you know, I do have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I check those a little less than LinkedIn right. and, and Facebook, um, but I'm usually pretty easy to reach because I'm on online at designated times during the day, uh, frequently enough. Right. No. Okay. Well, I, I just encourage anyone listening to this right now, especially if, uh, you know, you're a parent and you have a son or a daughter that, you know, struggling, but you're not sure what to say or how to even break the ice with them, you know, reach out to Ann Moss. She will help you or check out her blog. There'll be, you know, a lot of answers to your questions are right in there. I mean, (laughs) like you said, there's so many, so many great things. And then your book, um, Emotionally Naked, A Teacher's Guides to Preventing Suicide and Recognizing Students at Risk. Um, I think that's a, a, a book that we all should get, especially those with children. And, 
and uh, that kind of thing. So is there any last words you'd like to share with our listeners? Uh, any last things that you'd want to, to, to maybe close with? Well, one is uh, Kimberly O'Brien, licensed clinical social worker and PhD is my co-writer for that second book. I just gotcha. wanted to give no. her a plug in as well. Sorry, Kimberly. I think, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is really just listen and work on that art of listening. And if you're in a dark place, start, I guess, opposite action. So you don't want to do something new. You don't want to change. You don't want to get out of bed. Figure out a way that you can get out of bed and, and start to see those cracks of light, of joy, right. yeah. that going through difficult times can sometimes obscure. And that takes some work. So the way I got out of bed was all you have to do right now is put your feet on the floor. Turn around, put your feet on the floor. That's all you have to do. Right. Yeah. Broke it down to micro steps. So figure out how you can break something down to micro steps and figure out one person you can tell that will help you get to connected to the help that you need to work yourself out of this. Wow. Love that. Well, Ann Moss Rogers, you are amazing. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking some time to be on my show today. Our listeners, myself, we needed to hear this today. Um, this message needs to be heard more now than ever. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think you mentioned in one of your talks that the number one cause of death for girls 14 to 19 years old is now suicide. And it, it just goes to tell you how much your message needs to be heard and shared. And so I want to challenge everyone listening to this right now. Um, please share this with some, someone, you know, that may be struggling that just needs to hear this. It may be a good icebreaker for you. If you're not sure what to tell them, um, let them listen to Ann Moss Rogers voice and, and her passion and light to help other people. I think that'll be a huge thing for them. And it'll also give you a resource to be able to tap back into that when you want to talk to them. So, Ann Moss, you're amazing. Thank you for taking some time today with me. And um, I just love what you're doing. Thank you. I love what you're doing. And I hope uh, all you listening will also leave a rating and review because we need these mental health podcasts to start to uh, come to the top. <laughs> Absolutely. We need more of this for sure. And we're going to make that happen. You and I are going to team up on this and we're going to push this and we're going to advertise this and we're going to make it happen. So love you guys for tuning in. I told you this was going to be another great guest, but also it's a very sensitive and tough subject to talk about. But uh, Ann Moss just makes us feel at home when we talk to her. So please reach out to her. Please share all our stuff. Please, if you have a question, reach out to her or you can reach out to me. And then if you need help, I'm going to give that number one more time. The Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 800 800- 273-8255 and then there's a crisis text 741-741 love you guys and moss you're amazing thank you so much thank you all right until next time everybody